Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you everybody for coming on a somewhat uh, damp and dispiriting Sunday afternoon uh, to the most recent in our series of public uh, lectures on behalf of the Cambridge Muslim College. Uh, as you may have um, surmised from looking around, this is not actually part of the college. We're next door. We're very grateful to uh, St. Paul's Church for allowing us to use this recently uh, refurbished space for this, for this lecture. Um, I don't think it's necessary really for me to introduce William with a, a vast fanfare um, because um, many of you will be familiar with, um, with many if not all of his works. Um, but I should say that some of them, courtesy of Waterstones, will be available at a discount um, afterwards, uh, particularly his most recent book, uh, Return of a King, uh, which is uh, something which has appeared in this country, but not yet in America, so, right? so it really is very new this week. Yeah. Um, William is a Cambridge person. The light is on, so can people hear? The red light is showing. Okay. Is that a bit better? Yeah. No? All right. Well, I shall just have to project my voice. Obviously, the problem lies in the uh, amplifier. Uh, William was at Trinity College uh, and has, uh, uh, is related, is it nephew or grandnephew? Great nephew. Virginia Wolf. So there's a connect- Cambridge connection there as well. Um, it's a real joy to be able to welcome him, particularly since uh, many of the main uh, research and teaching activities of our little college here are related to some of the things that are dear to his heart, particularly the, the deeper structures, the metabolic relationship um, between the British story and the Indian story. Our students at the Cambridge Muslim College come here for a one-year intensive um, dip into the choppy waters of uh, the Cambridge intellectual world. Most of them, uh, this year almost all of them, have roots in the subcontinent, but they are training to run uh, mosques and chaplaincy teams uh, across the country in the new world of British Islam. So we're interested in precisely the kind of area that William has really made it his life's work to explore in such such an accessible and inspirational way. We're fascinated by the the positive aspects of this engagement, uh, this that go back, uh, as he has shown, for at least 200 years and it's a great honour to be able to welcome him. I believe you'll be taking questions afterwards, um, so please um, feel free to store up questions, after which there will be uh, a book signing, uh, and I think about 100 copies of The Return of a King are available, uh, should you wish to avail yourselves of the discount. The the story uh, I'm going to be telling you today even if I sound a bit like a Dalek, uh, as I say it, uh, is the story of what, from the British perspective, is probably the greatest colonial catastrophe of the 19th century. In In a nutshell, the legend of this first Afghan war, as related back to a British public in the 19th century, was that 18,000 British troops marched in and one man came out. In reality, it's much more complicated than that. Most of the British troops were, in fact, sepoys from UP and Bihar. Uh, There were very few uh, white British in that army. And rather than one person coming out, in fact, 10 or 11 people made it through to Jalalabad, and about 2,000 eventually uh, returned to India, having been liberated from slave markets and so on. But the other perspective on this war was, of course, it was an almost miraculous defeat of the most aggressive imperial power of its day by a group of tribesmen using technology which was about 200 years out of date. And from the Afghan perspective, the first Afghan war is a story of national triumph, a story of uh, a people uh, uniting against a, uh, a foreign foe, defeating them, and sinking their differences in the process and and a a nation state emerging from the terrible destruction and death which this war caused. And while there have been many books on the subject, there's a Victorian shelves heaving with this tale. This is the first book in English to tell the story of this war using both the Afghan sources, uh, which are largely in Dari rather than Pashtun, interestingly, it's a Persian Persianate culture at this point, Afghanistan, and um, which 
portray this conflict as the Afghan equivalent, I suppose in English terms, of Trafalgar, Waterloo and the Battle of Britain rolled into one. And one of the reasons this war is so interesting to study is it's a uniquely well documented war. Everyone on the British side was writing letters and keeping diaries and one can access a lot of those in London in the National Army Museum or the British Library. Uh, many of them ex sort of excitingly sort of gnarled and bloodstained and uh, often ending halfway through a, a, a sort of entry. Uh, it's a very uh, resonant war to look at. But as I discovered on a succession of visits to Kabul, Kandahar and Herat, this is also a war which is absolutely central to Afghan history and is commemorated. I mean, my research in Afghanistan was relatively brief, a matter of months, but in the course of that research I came back with no less than nine full-length Afghan accounts of the conflict, including two full-length epic poems, the Akbar Nama and the Jang Nama, um, an autobiography of the principal of the Karzai character of the day, the, the, the man the British put into power, Shah Shuja, and a, uh, a variety of later 19th century Afghan court histories. Uh, some of them pretty reliable and accurate and, and discriminating. Um, so it's a war where one can do that very rarest of things of really weighing up both sides of the conflict. Uh, although obviously the evidence of a, of a sort of military uh, accountant general is a very different sort of fact to the the truths of an epic poem, uh, which I mean, if, if the accountant general says 515 troops left Barakpur and headed for Meerut, you can be pretty sure that 515 or that sort of number did. If an epic poet says a million brave, brave Ghazis came down on the Farangs, uh, maybe it wasn't exactly a million, but it's still a useful, uh, uh, it's still a useful source, and particularly in terms of attitudes, because the attitudes to the British are enjoyably a mirror image of British, modern British attitudes to the Afghans. In the diary sources, the British are treacherous, duplicitous, women abusing terrorists who, who uh, take no heed of civilian casualties. Uh, that's not a, a, a writer's riff, that's literally how the Brits are portrayed in the diary sources. Uh, there is great um, uh, anger about the way civilian casualties uh, are, are, are inflicted by the British. Uh, there is huge anger about the way the British turned Kabul into an enormous brothel, uh, paying women to go into the cantonment, uh, and um, the British are regarded as being very quick to break their word. Uh, so exactly the image of the duplicitous Oriental uh, or, the, or the woman abusing Taliban reflected back on the colonial power. As one researches this war, it's very difficult to do so writing it in the current climate without seeing, of course, the very strong parallels. This is the British ambassador in Tehran uh, early on in the conflict. We should declare that he who is not with us is against us. We must secure Afghanistan. And you get these echoes over and over again, and the closer you get to the detail, the closer the parallels become. Quite often you find in history something that looks similar to something that is familiar to us. And you look closely and it all begins to fall apart. But in this case you have extraordinary degree to which, for example, Karzai is from the same tiny sub-tribe of the Duranis, the Popolzai, as Shah Shuja, the guy we put in last time. And the guys who bring down Shah Shuja, the Eastern Gilzai, today make up the foot soldiers of the Taliban. So one has these extraordinary echoes running from this story uh, through to the present. But there are also important differences, and, and in the course of this lecture I'll touch on those. I'd like you to imagine, to begin with, being somewhere out on the step between Meshed in northeast Iran and what's now the Afghan frontier at Herat uh, in western Afghanistan.
on a hot summer's night in 1837. And a young British intelligence officer who's been working with the Shah of Iran to train up his artillery to take on the Russians, who've already eaten into about a quarter of the Persian Empire in the course of the last 30, 40 years. This young artillery officer is heading from the south of the country up to the northeast to join the Shah on the eve of a projected attack on Herat. Herat is the disputed border city which uh, has been fought over between Persians and Afghans uh, for centuries. And this is one of the many frequent attempts by the Persians to take Herat back. 1837. Rawlinson, having ridden for two nights and a day, two days and a night rather, loses himself on the third night, loses the road, and wanders in the desert nervously because he's only got a groom with him. This is dangerous, marginal, disputed territory at the best of times. And particularly at the moment, it is, uh, there are warring armies on either side of him. He loses his way. And just as dawn is breaking, he sees the first light on the Kohi Shah Jahan mountains rising up. And as the early morning light, he can see ahead of him, down the valley, a rising dust cloud, which over the following 20 minutes resolves itself into a very large body of horsemen heading towards him. Now this man is lost, he's on his own, and so he does what any of us would do in this situation, he backs off a little down a side valley and hides himself in a little cleft in the rock and watches these horsemen come towards him. He presumes that they are smugglers or brigands or possibly the Afghans from Herat coming to Meshed or possibly the uh, Persians heading towards Herat having got lost like him in the middle of the night. But as they draw closer, he sees they're not any of those. Instead, they are Imperial Russian Cossack cavalry. And his groom who's with him recognizes among the horsemen his counterpart, a groom at the Russian legation in Tehran. And this one chance sighting, which could easily not have happened, because it's only because Rawlinson had got lost and had disappeared off the road, that he sees this party heading into Afghanistan. This one chance sighting becomes to the next first Anglo-Afghan war what that little stray nugget of intelligence which subsequently proved to be false about the yellow cake in Nigeria was to the Iraq war. It becomes a nugget of intelligence which a group of ideologically driven hawks who are after a war anyway for their own reasons, build up into a case for war. They manipulate the intelligence, they make it more solid than it actually is, they make it sound as if it's an established fact what's going on, when in fact there's all sorts of questions about who these horsemen are, whether it's an official expedition, what they're doing in Afghanistan and so on. But by spring 1839, the East India Company has put into the field a huge army ready to attack Afghanistan. Now the context for all this is as follows. Since the 1760s, the East India Company has been transforming itself from an already century and a half old trading organization, which was originally founded to bring uh, the spices and the silks of India for sale to this country and Europe. The East India Company is transforming itself into a military power. It remains a public company with accounts, a boardroom, an office in London, uh, shareholders, all the things that any other company uh, has. But unlike other companies, it is increasingly a military power with a large standing army, soon to be the largest standing army in Asia, uh, and an empire the size of a subcontinent. Think Microsoft with army or uh, Pepsi-Cola with an Air Force, I think would be the modern equivalent. Uh, not uh, a, a very um, happy thought, I think it's fair to say. Uh, uh, and um, the East India Company, for, for, since the 1760s, the previous 70 years, has been aggressively gobbling up chunks of South Asia 
left vulnerable by the century-old decline of the Mughal Empire. The Mughal Empire begins to fragment in the, about 1707 at the death of Aurangzeb. And in the aftermath of that, the company moves out of Calcutta, Madras and Bombay, and a single governor-general, Lord Wellesley, the elder brother of the Duke of Wellington, conquers more of India than Napoleon conquers of Europe. So these are huge conquests in a very short time by a very unlikely institution. At the same time, the Russians are moving south from the Orenburg Line and are on the verge of beginning that, their series of conquests that will bring them to subjugate the Khanates and Emirates of Bukhara, Samarkand, Kiva, the states that now make up modern Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. And anyone sitting in a war room in London or a, um, a gentleman's club in Pall Mall or, or a strategy room in St. Petersburg looking at the map can see that these two European land-based empires are heading towards each other fast and will converge at some point if this trajectory continues somewhere in the Hindu Kush. And the hawks on both sides want to be the first to grab the high ground. If you look at the map, there is this area in the middle which very little detail exists. There has been no proper cartography of this area. A few cities uncertainly placed on the map are all that either power knows. But it's already clear that anyone that controls Afghanistan controls the route from Iran to China and from Central Asia to South Asia, to India. Uh, and there is a whole series of polemics which are written in London in the 1820s and 1830s urging the British to seize Afghanistan first because Russia, they say, is going to do so if we don't. Ironically, Russia is not, in fact, at this stage at all interested in Afghanistan. There are four or five emirates separating them from Afghanistan in a thousand miles. And the steamy fantasies of these armchair strategists actually shrink the distance that separates the actual Russian forces at Orenburg uh, from, uh, from Balkh and, and anywhere that is in modern Afghanistan. And just as it's fair to say that there was virtually no Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq before America invaded, but there was a huge Al-Qaeda presence in Iraq after it. In other words, the Americans created the nightmare they feared. So at this period, the British send into um, Central Asia, uh, this is Vitkovich, the man who led the, uh, the, this unofficial Russian mission into Afghanistan. In the middle is Dost Mohammed Khan, the self-made emir of, uh, of Afghanistan, uh, who uh, declares himself the leader of the faithful and ousts Shah Shuja, the grandson of Ahmed Shah Durrani, the existing ruler. And the British send in this man, whoops, we can get him, Alexander Burns. And Alexander Burns, who is an intelligence agent, does a journey to Bukhara, presents his papers to, uh, intelligence papers to the Indian government, but also writes a popular bestseller. Uh, and when that popular bestseller is translated into French, the Russians wake up for the first time to the fact that there are British intelligence agents snooping around in Bukhara, and that is the thing that leads them to send their first agents back. So again you have this thing of paranoia creating the nightmare that you fear when it doesn't actually exist beforehand. So, the Burns goes back on another expedition, reports to his masters in Calcutta that Dost Mohammed Khan uh, is in fact perfectly willing to do a deal with the British. He is open, in touch with the Russians but would prefer a deal with London. His advice is ignored due to reasons of departmental jealousy. Burns is young, a star, he's got this bestseller, he's been received by the king and he puts everyone's noses out who's senior to him in the uh, civil service in India. And his bosses deliberately would, um, disregard his, his advice, although none of them have actually been to Afghanistan. And instead they decide on this enormous expedition to put Shah Shuja, the ousted ruler, 
the grandson of Ahmad Shah Durrani, who founded the first Afghan Durrani Empire, back on the throne as a British puppet, through whom they will get control of the markets uh, and, the, uh, and the passes of Central Asia, and thus preempt a Russian advance and allow a huge expansion of British trade in the region. The army gets ready to go in 1837. There are 14,000 East India Company sepoys, 6,000 irregulars, around 21,000 troops in all, 38,000 Indian camp followers on 30,000 camels. One brigadier needs 50 camels to carry his kit, while the ranking British general takes 260. Uh, there are 30 camels carrying just Madeira and claret, uh, and there are 20 camels carrying cheroots and cigars, and one camel carrying eau de cologne. <laughs> uh, and off they go, and there's no very clear sense of the geography. Uh, Ranjit Singh, the Sikh leader, seen here on his elephant, um, outmaneuvers the British in diplomacy, uh, and in the end bans the British from passing through the Punjab. And so the British do this absurd loop down the Ganges, down the, uh, to the Indus at Shikarpur, then all the way up the Indus through the Bolan, and the, uh, here they all are setting off. Um, they've got munchies and wagons, prisoners, sheep, cattle, goats, all what have you. And off they go through these ludicrous passes through which they have to drag, they have to take thousands of cannon, they have to dis disassemble the cannon, carry each, have hundreds of people slaving up with these, with these uh, disassembled cannons, other people carrying wheels. They've no very clear idea where they're going because they haven't got any good maps. And there's wonderful pictures of them just heading off into the mountains, vaguely hoping that Afghanistan uh, will be somewhere in the north if they carry on going, uh, as they really don't have any maps at all that are reliable. Uh, and um, on the way they're sniped at by Baluchis um, and the poor sepoys from UP and Bihar who've never been out of the plains of Hindustan have left in their winter uniforms find themselves going through baking deserts of Baluchistan with 100 degrees, there's no clear idea where the water is the whole thing is an incredible fiasco and people on this march compare it to Napoleon's uh, retreat from Moscow People are dying of starvation. That one regiment takes its own foxhounds, and they end up having to eat the foxhounds um, uh, on the way, uh, as there's no other food. They run out of goats and sheep. But such is the surprise when the remnants of this army appear at the back end of Kandahar that the rulers of Kandahar run off. They then decide, that having caught Kandahar so easily, they're told their advanced intelligence tells them that, the, that Ghazni, the next town, is undefended and there are no serious walls or defences to Ghazni, so they leave their cannon behind. Uh, when they get there, they find that Ghazni has indeed got the most magnificent fortress in Central Asia. Uh, but they still they blow down the front door, and in they go the first night, and uh, commit a massacre in the fortress, and within a month, they've restored Shah Shuja to the old Durrani palace buildings at the centre of the Bala Hizar of Kabul. And as with the 2002 invasion of Afghanistan, the hawks have the pleasure of telling the naysayers that in fact it's a lot easier than everyone had thought. Contrary to all the warnings of the naysayers, including all the British Afghan experts who'd made sorts of, all sorts of valid points like how do you can take an army in but how you can kind of take it out again, all this sort of stuff. It's very easy to conquer but how do you, how do you establish your rule in this country? How are you going to pay for all this? The Hawks administration uh, at this stage seem as if they've won the argument because Shah Shuja is established back in his throne. He seems perfectly popular, um, not adulated, but people seem perfectly happy to have him as their ruler. Uh, the, the virtually no casualties in the conquest and Britain suddenly finds itself controlling all the main passes controlling Central Asia. And so there's a moment of great celebration in Calcutta and Simla this long shot invasion through almost unknown territory, having initially looked as if it was going very badly wrong, has managed to retake Kabul with barely a shot being fired. Dost Mohammed has run off into, the, into Bukhara uh, and Shah Shuja's rule is established. And initially uh, it looks as if this whole gamble has paid off 
for the Hawks. But in the success of this uh, expedition uh, lies the undoing of it. Because such is the ease of the conquest that the British assume the Afghans are easily subjugated. And they, as you can see in this picture, merely line their tents up in the plain outside Kabul. Um, and uh, you can see here the tents are all lined up. And in due course they build a ditch around it and a wooden palisade. Uh, but as you can see, the plain is overlooked on all sides by small mountains. And it's a completely indefensible site. And no one at this point seems to have occurred to anyone that, any, that there would be any resistance and any need to have a, a secure, fortified base at the centre of Kabul. And again, initially, it, it's a very easy occupation, which again resembles what happened in Kabul in 2002, 2003, 2004. The Memsabs are brought up from Simla. Lady Sale appears. Um, uh, Nicholas has a first edition with him here, which anyone can look at, I'm sure, afterwards. Lady Sale writes in her diary, My sweet peas and geraniums were much admired, and in the kitchen garden the potatoes particularly thrive. There is cricket and horse racing and open-air amateur theatricals, and as winter draws in, snipe and duck shooting, skating and snowman building. And what's left of the foxhounds are taken out hunting, and Alexander Burns, who's now the Deputy Governor, throws a Christmas party with Scottish reels and bagpipes and presides over it all in Highland dress, complete with a kilt and an enormous sporran. There's already discreet talk about annexing Afghanistan and making Kabul, rather than Simla, the summer capital of the British Raj. But then it slowly starts to go wrong. As with the current occupation, the British realise that they have to train up an Afghan national army in order to keep their puppet in place after they withdraw. So they, have to, they start training up an army, but in order to pay for it, they have to start taking estates away from the existing noblemen. It's been a feudal system. Uh, and they manage to alienate many of Shah Shuja's supporters by taking away their estates and leaving them penniless. Worse still, the British, uh, Shah Shuja appears with all his family. Worse still, sorry, here is... Um, Das Muhammad Khan uh, emerging from his captivity in Balkh and surrendering to Sir William McNaughton, the Governor General. But the next problem, as well as the estates, is the Afghan women. And the British take rather a liking to them. And it seems that there is a regular ferrying of the women of Kabul into the cantonment in, under Burqa Kaba. Um, and them coming back a little richer. And this, of course, outrages all Afghan notions of honour. And when Alexander Burns seduces a favourite slave girl of Abdullah Khan Achaksai, who's one of the leading nobles in Kabul, that the thing really begins to go out of control. Here is the account of Mirza Atta Muhammad, who is one of the best uh, chroniclers of the uprising. It happened by God's will that a slave girl of Abdullah Khan Achaksai ran away from, to the house of his house, to the house of Alexander Burns. When on inquiry, it was found out where she had gone. The Khan, beside himself with fury, sent his attendants to fetch the silly girl back. But the Scotsman, swollen with pride, cursing and swearing, had the Khan's attendants severely beaten and thrown out of the house. The Khan then summoned the other Sadars and said, Now we are justified in throwing off the English yoke. They stretch the hand of tyranny to dishonour private citizens great and small. Making love to a slave girl isn't worth the ritual bath that follows it, but we have to put a stop right here, right now, otherwise, and this is my favourite quote in the whole book, the English will ride the donkey of their desires into the field of stupidity. I put my trust in God and raise the battle standard of our Prophet Muhammad and thus go to fight. If success rewards us, then it is as we wished. And if we die in battle, that is better than to live with degradation and dishonour. The other Sadars, his childhood friends, tightened their belts and girt their loins and prepared for jihad. So, Burns ha wakes up in early dawn to find his house surrounded and Abdullah Khan Achaksai's men crawling up the roof and onto his terrace. He tries to escape out the back dressed as an Afghan and is hacked to death. 
His boss, Sir Henry McNaughton, William McNaughton, goes out to negotiate and is shot dead by Wazir Akbar Khan, who is Dost Muhammad's son. The British managed to lose all their food and all their ammunition within the first four days of the uprising. They are so overconfident that they've kept their ammunition and their food supplies not within the cantonment proper, but in small outlying forts closer to the old city, and these are captured by the insurgents in the first two days. Had the British general, um, here we are with the, um, the Afghans pulling cannon onto the small hills and just pelting the cantonments with shells. Had the British ranking general William Elphinstone responded firmly, there's every possibility that at this stage that the insurgency could have been suppressed because at this stage there are only about 500 men uh, up against the British and they have 5,000 trained sepoys. But William, El William Elphinstone, the, uh, the general, is riddled with gout. He hasn't seen action since Waterloo 40 years earlier. He tries to get on his horse, he falls off his horse, the horse falls on him and that's that. Uh, and there is no British response to the uprising. Um, so the insurgency grows. And all sorts of different disparate groups. And again, one of the things that's very clear in the Afghan sources is that while the British see only an undifferentiated wall of, of Afghan beards, they write about this, this united fanatics and bigots outside, in reality there are a whole lot of very different groups. There are the Kohistanis who come under their Naqshbandi peer, Mir Haji, uh, to fight uh, with the, uh, the Tajiks after one particular thing. They want their promised payment from the British, which they haven't been given, for rising up against Shah Shuja. There are royalists who want to keep Shah Shuja but get rid of, um, but get rid of uh, the British. And then there are the Barakzais who want to get rid of both Shah Shuja and the British. So three completely different groups with very different aims uh, are camped in different places, operating independently. Uh, but to the British it's all, you know, Afghans. Um, uh, and, and they don't make any distinction uh, but, uh, between the very different forces ranged against them. But having lost their food and ammunition, they are screwed, really. There's nothing much they can do. Uh, um, they hold out for a month, they eat the rest of their foxhounds, and then it's, uh, it's uh, nothing, there's no option but to surrender. And Wazir Akbar Khan, the resistance leader, um, where is he? here he is, uh, offers them safe passage back to India if they surrender their artillery. And they have no option but to accept these terms. And on the 6th of January 1842, what's left of the British army begins the march back to India. There are four and a half thousand troops, 700 of them European, the rest company sepoys, and some 12,000 camp followers. And they begin their march back towards Jalalabad. And George Lawrence writes in his diary a description. At 9 a.m. the troops moved off. A crouching, drooping, dispirited army. So different from the smart, light-hearted body of men they appeared some time ago. The men sinking a foot deep in each step. And my heart sunk within me under the conviction that we were a doomed force. One of the Brits on the retreat is my great-great-uncle. Um, you mentioned Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf's uncle actually, um, Sir Colin Mackenzie, and he writes a, a remarkable diary uh, that records the retreat. Uh, and I think he's, he's the most sensitive diarist of the British at this time. I don't say that just because he's my relation. He remembers as one of the most heart-rending sights of that humiliating day, fixing my eyes by chance on a little Hindustani child, perfectly naked, sitting in the snow with no mother or father near her. She was a beautiful little girl, about two years old, just strong enough to sit upright with her little legs doubled underneath her and her hair curling in soft, waving locks around her little throat and her great black eyes dilated to twice their normal size, fixed on the armed men, the passing cavalry, the strange sights that met her gaze. Many other children as young and innocent I saw slain on the road, and women with their long dark hair wet with their own blood. The rearguard had to fight the whole way to Bagrami, and pass through a 
literally a continuous line of poor wretches, men, women and children, dead or dying from cold and the wounds, who, unable to move, entreated their comrades to kill them and put an end to their misery. The British don't make the same mistake as they made during the uprising. They don't guard their supplies. And having been given food and... I mean, uh, uh, sorry, food and um, tents to make the journey back, the Ghazis swoop down on the last of the column as they're leaving the cantonments and they seize the tents and they seize the food. So by the time the British reach their camping place and night is falling and the temperatures are dropping, they suddenly realize they have no shelter and they've got nothing to eat. A few of the women have brought a little sherry or some cold meats in their, in their handbags. Uh, but by and large, they go to bed hungry. They still have five or six days' march ahead of them. And there are Afghans with the force, the Jezelchis, who have these long Afghan, you could call them sniper rifles, 19th century long range uh, heavy muskets. Uh, and these guys know exactly what to do. They, light, they clear a circle in the snow. They light a fire in the middle and they lie down body to body using their body heat to keep them alive with their feet facing the fire. Uh, and they put all their cloaks and their, their blankets and whatever they have on top of them. And that way they don't have a very comfortable night but they remain free from frostbite uh, using their, each other's body heat to keep them going. But the poor old sepoys from Bihar and UP have absolutely no idea how to keep alive in the snow. They're totally unprepared for what they need for this um, night in the, in the freezing cold. And they just go down, they, they just curl up in the snow and wake up the following morning to find they have feet that look like charred logs of wood. They've got frostbite and they can't use their muskets, they can't crawl, they're completely unable to move. At this point the Afghans appear from the rear, led by Akbar Khan, and herd them into the Kodkabul Pass, where an extraordinary ambush has been prepared. For ten days, the Gilzai has been preparing slit trenches at exactly the height where the Jezails can shoot down on the British, but the short-range British muskets, the Brambeth musket, can't return fire as they have too short a range. And the retreating army files into this pass, which can only have about four or five people abreast, and once they're safely in, the ambush is sprung. Lady Sale is at the lead. The confusion was fearful. We had not proceeded half a mile when we were heavily fired upon. The pony Mrs. Sturt rode was wounded in the ear and the neck, and I fortunately had only one ball in my arm. Three others passed through my cloak near the shoulder without doing me any injury. The pass completely choked up, and for a considerable period we were stationary under heavy fire. The sepoys and camp followers, half frozen, tried to force their way not only into my tent but into my bed. The poor wretches died around the tent that night. Women and children were abducted. Colin McKenzie and um, um, here's that Khan. Colin McKenzie and um, this is Colin McKenzie and George Lawrence are given up as hostages. And they end of that day, they're taken back through this pass and see the scenes of horror. We came across bloody scenes. Sepoys and camp followers were everywhere being stripped and plundered on all sides, and such as refused to give up their money and valuables were instantly stabbed or cut down. On seeing this, the poor creatures cried out for help, many of them recognizing me and calling me by name, but what could we do? The gills' eyes had now tasted blood and clearly showed their tigerish nature, becoming very savage and fierce in their demeanor towards us demanding that we should be given up to them for sacrifice, brandishing their long blood-stained knives in our faces and telling us to look upon the heaps of carcasses around us, for you shall soon be among them. You came to Kabul for fruit, did you? How do you like it now? As we proceeded, we met numbers of the enemy's horse and foot returning to Kabul, laden with plunder on all sides. One miscreant had a little Indian girl seated on the, thro on the horse beside him. 18,000 men, women and children left Kabul on the 6th of January. There's only 15,000 that move into the Kod Kabul Pass that night. 10,000 make it through the Kod Kabul. Of those, 5,000 are killed that night of the cold 
up on the high Tezin Pass unprotected. A further 5,000 die the following night at the top of the Tezin Pass. There are only 400 who make it to uh, the village of Jagdalik three nights later. Uh, there they are confronted by a holly hedge blocking the narrow in the, in the pass. As they try to crawl over it, half of them impale themselves on the thorns. Others, in the panic, uh, are backed up. The horse trample, under them, trample them under. Uh, and only 200 foot make it beyond. And they're exposed the following dawn on the hill at Gundamuk. There they fight on to their last bullet and then fight on with bayonets. They're all slaughtered save one man, Thomas Souter, who's taken hostage because he's wrapped the regimental colours around him uh, and uh, he's thought to be an English lord good for ransom. One man, sorry, three horses, three cavalry, make it through to Shah Jahan's Nimla Gardens where they're off for breakfast and while they're eating they get knocked on the head by the gardeners. One man makes it on to Jalalabad. Dr. Bryden, the assistant surgeon, he survives only because he's wrapped up a literary magazine, Blackwood's magazine, in his forage cap. And when the Afghans take a swipe at him, it goes through the magazine, but not through his skull. And he makes it through. Several other Gurkhas, who are good in the snow and know how to survive, make it in over the days that follow. There's a Greek merchant. But the legend of one man surviving is not so far wrong. Of this 18,000 troops that left, probably about 200 officers and women are taken hostage. Maybe 4,000 sepoys are enslaved and sent off to the slave markets of Bukhara uh, and the Uzbek uh, steppe. The Uzbeks have a particularly unpleasant technique. They use horsehair um, rope, which they tie to their captives' clavicles around their, around their chest uh, and they drag them by the horses and if you don't keep up you wrench your clavicle out of your chest bone. Um, and uh, that night the ranking general in Jalalabad, General Sale sends out a search parties to scour the plains imagining there must be other parties that are holding out in villages or in the, in, in the mountains, but all they find is corpses. That night, lamps are raised on the gates and bugles blown to drive in, to guide in any last stragglers, but not one limps in. A strong wind was blowing from the south. This is a young officer, Thomas Souter, who is on the battlements that night, which sent the sound of bugles all over the town. The terrible wailing sound of those bugles I will never forget. It was a dirge for our slaughtered soldiers and heard through the night had an inexpressibly mournful and depressing effect. But obviously for the Afghans this is a near miraculous deliverance. The British are at this point at the very peak of their world economic power. The British, who traditionally in, in the Middle Ages controlled about 5% of world trade, by 1840, control as much as they will ever control, which is about 50% of the world's GDP. It'll go down by the 1850s, with the rise of Germany, and by the 1870s, America's kicking in, and British economic share of the world begins to reduce again to what it is again today, back to around 5%. But at this point, the British control half the world economy, and yet at this moment of supreme economic power, an army has not just been defeated by primitive tribesmen aimed with, armed with the kind of things the Mughals were fighting with in the 1600s. They have completely and utterly destroyed an army. Here's Mirza Atta again. The story already begins to get exaggerated. The numbers are actually around 18,000, but this is what Mirza Atta writes. It is said that 60,000 English troops half from Bengal, half from other provinces, without counting servants and camp followers, went to Afghanistan, and only a handful came back alive, wounded and destitute. The rest fell with neither grave nor shroud to cover them, and lay scattered in that land like rotting donkeys. For the English love gold and money so much that they cannot stop themselves from laying their hands on any area productive of wealth. 
But what prize did they find in Khorasan? Except on one hand the exhausting of their treasury and on the other the disgracing of their army. It is said that 40,000 English troops have been in Kabul and many have been taken captive en route. Some remained as cripples and beggars in Kabul. The rest perished in the mountains like a ship sunk without trace. For it is no easy thing to invade and occupy the kingdom of Khorasan. The English had hoped to establish them, themselves in our land and to block any Russian advance. But for all the treasure they expended and for all the lives they sacrificed, the only result was ruin and disgrace. For if the English had been able to take and keep Afghanistan, would they have ever left this land where 44 different types of grape grow? And other fruit as well. Apples, pomegranates, pears, rhubarb, mulberries, sweet watermelon and must melon, apricots and peaches, ah, and ice water that cannot be found in all the plains of Hindustan. For these Indians know neither how to dress nor how to eat. God save me from the fire of their dal and their miserable japatis. <laughs> That's Mirza Atta signing off. <laughs> so um, the British then, to try and save face, want to rescue their hostages. There's a hostage crisis, again something that uh, has much resonance with contemporary events. And Lady Sale and, and, and uh, 40 others have been taken hostage. Uh, Sir Nicholas again has some of these pictures, I think, uh, in his collection. Um, and um, the British send in a second army called the Army of Retribution. And the Army of Retribution is led by a much more competent general, General Pollock, who goes in, he's merciless as he is meticulous. He takes the Khyber and he advances slowly into Afghanistan, making none of the errors made by his predecessors. He sends flanking parties up into the mountains so that they can't be fired down on. And as he goes, he destroys every house, burns every village, ploughs up every field, barks every tree. Leaves Afghanistan, southern Afghanistan, completely devastated. Rescues the hostages. And his final parting gift to Afghanistan is to dynamite the great Charchata Bazaar, built by Shah Jahan, or rather his governor, Ali Madan Khan, at the same time as the Taj is going up in Agra. This is the supreme piece of, Af of Mughal domestic architecture in Central Asia and Pollock dynamites it as a parting gift and heads back to India. At the same time, discreetly, Dost Muhammad Khan is released from, here he is, released from prison and is welcomed back with dancing and celebrations. The man who the entire war was fought to oust, quite unnecessarily, is put back with the British say-so. As we know this very week, David Cameron has been meeting President Karzai to encourage him to negotiate with the Taliban, who the original war in 2002 was fought to oust. Similar trajectory again. When I was researching this, I realised that early on, that if I was to make a decent fist of, of, of writing this book, I'd have to find some way of following the route of the retreat, which is clearly going to be the emotional climax of the book. I couldn't describe it unless I'd actually been there. And um, I was very worried because the second half of the retreat around Gandamak is now very deep into Taliban territory, and Gandamak, the place of the British last stand um, of the the 44th, hang on, the 44th foot uh, backs onto the mountains behind our Tora Bora, where Bin Laden made his last stand. Uh, so um, I had a lucky break, however, because it's not often that you find you have a fan who is a secret policeman. Uh, but uh, it turned out that Amrullah Saleh, who was um, uh, Karzai's head of security, head of the NDS, um, the Afghan internal security, had read Last Mughal. He thought I was far too easy on Bahadur Zafar, who in his view lacked patriotic zeal and didn't put up a, de a decent resistance. Anyway, he agreed to try and help me um, do a better job this time. <laughs> and uh, he um, kitted me up with this fabulous character called Anwar Khan Jigdalik, 
who was the former captain of the Afghan Olympic wrestling team. He's about 18 feet wide by 10 foot tall. Um, and a fabulous old crook who um, uh, had just come in. He's a former Hezbi Islami commander. Apparently a deeply corrupt man, but very sweet to me. And very hospitable in the way that Afghans are. And we, he took me off, because his village is Jigdalik, where the Holly Hedge was, a one day's march from Gundamak. Uh, and today it's only about an hour and a half drive from Jigdalik to Gundamak. And so he thought he could get me through there uh, in safety. And Amrul Saleh said it's the only chance you'll have to get there. So we went off together and we bumped out. Anyone who's been travelling with, with Afghan warlords will know the scenario. You leave Kabul in this whole succession of pickup trucks with all these sort of dodgy looking guys. With, they wear their uh, turbans wound around their heads with um, uh, rocket propelled grenades and AK-47s and what have you. And it's all very exciting. And off we bump down the uh, Kord Kabul Pass, past the site of the various massacres and uh, places I've been reading about for two or three years and was very excited to see firsthand. And eventually we arrived at Jigdalik, uh, where it turned out Amar Khan was, of course, the local hero. So we had to stop, and the, uh, the carpets were put down in an apricot grove, and the most enormous feast was cooked for us, with um, sheep were killed, and mulberry pulao and gorgeous kebabs and tent flaps of naan and all the usual stuff and it went on and on and on hour after hour and it very, became clear about five o'clock that we weren't going to get to Gundamal because we just had too much to eat <laughs> and it was time to go home and it was getting dark uh, so rather disappointedly we headed back to Jalalabad by the main road by Sarobi rather than heading into, uh, into the mountains and arrived in Jalalabad to find we'd actually had a very lucky Safe because unknown to us that morning the government had happened to go out to burn the poppy crop in Gandamak and the villagers had got in the Taliban to resist them and there had been an enormous firefight nine police vehicles had been blown up um, three people had been killed and a hundred hostages taken by the villagers uh, and had we turned up sort of you know burping at f- half past five uh, we would have got a rather warmer reception I think than we were counting on um, Anyway, the following day, Amar Khan took me to the Jirga because the elders of Gundamak came in to negotiate that they had their hostages and they wanted to talk to the government. They didn't want their crop destroyed. And we sat at this Jirga as all these predator drones took off from the airfield in Jalalabad behind us. And when you see some of those movies, like the Bourne, I don't know if you've watched the Bourne movies, there's always sort of one, um, one predator drone which acts independently. In Jalalabad, it's more like a kind of London taxi rank or sort of Cambridge station or something. These things all taking off one after another uh, and buzzing the hills around us. And I wanted to talk to the elders of Gandhi about whether they had any memories of all this. And of course, what emerged was that these names of these people like McNaughton and Burns, uh, who are long forgotten here. I mean, a few 19th century specialists, maybe St. Nicholas remembers these days, but uh, not many other people do. Um, but they are known to every villager in these valleys. And this is an absolutely central myth in Afghan nationalism, the defeat of the British in 1837. It often gets a bit muddled, you know, other Afghan wars get thrown in and, and, uh, uh, and, and the kind of time frame is often a bit wobbly. But the, st- the names are known and the fact of the defeat is known and the fact that their ancestors, you know, individuals, grandfathers were involved in it is known. It's exactly the same, said Jigdalik. Both times the foreigners have come here for their own interest, not for ours. They say we are your friends, we want to help, but they are lying. Whoever comes to Afghanistan, even now they will face the fate of Burns and McNaughton, agreed Mohammed Khan, the elder of Gundamak. He said, um, since the British went, we've had the Russians, we saw them off. But we are at the roof of the world. From here you can control and watch everywhere. Afghanistan is like a crossroads for every nation that comes to power. But we do not have the strength to control our own destiny. Our fate is determined by our neighbours. Last month, said one of the American officers, sorry, last month, said one of the elders, an American officer called us to a hotel in Jalalabad. And one of them asked me, why do you hate us? And I replied, because, this is the elder speaking, because you blow down our doors, enter our houses, pull our women by the hair, and kick our children. We cannot accept this. We will fight back and we will break your teeth. And when your teeth are broken, you will leave, just as the British left before you. It's just a matter of time. What did he say to that? 
He turned to his friend and said, if the old men are like this, what will the younger ones be like? In truth, all the Americans know that their game is over. It's just their politicians who deny this. This is the last days of the Americans, said Jigdalik. Next, it will be China. Thank you.